Welcome to the French Institute for this talk entitled A Decolonial Ecology. My name is Mathias Rambeau and I run the book department here. And we are delighted to host in person two brave people, Sheila Sheik and Malcolm Ferdinand, who in spite of the storm are here with us. <laughs> and you are as brave as they are because you, in spite of the storm, you came as well. Born and raised in Martinique, Malcolm Ferdinand is a civil and environmental engineer from University College London and a doctor in political philosophy from Université Paris Diderot. He is currently a researcher in the fields of political ecology and environmental humanities at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and based at the Université Paris Dauphine. He is the author of A Decolonial Ecology Thinking from the Caribbean World, published by Polity Books last year. This is a very important book in its field, and one could say it has created its, its own field. A book with a foreword by none other than Angela Davis herself. Uh, and Sheila Sheik is here with us as well from Goldsmith University. She will be chairing this discussion with Malcolm. Sheila has convened the MA Postcolonial Cultural and Global Policy since 2014, formerly in the Center for Cultural Studies and since 2017 in the Department of Media, Communications and Cultural Studies. Her work focuses mainly on decolonial and postcolonial approaches to environmental justice, in particular as this concerned cultural forms as well as diverse practices of witnessing and testimony. Sheila currently co-leads the Cold Smith uh, Critical Ecologies Research Stream with Dr. Wood Roberto. And I shall thank you, Sheila, for very much for organizing a, a, a teach out, a, a parallel Q&A this morning with Malcolm and some students in spite of the current situation in, in Goldsmith. This talk is, a part of, is part of our series of discussions on current issues and non-fiction publication in English translations, Books for Thought. This is a project by European Union National Institute for Culture London and the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni. And it is the recipient of a unique cluster fund grant with special funding in the framework of the French Presidency of the Council of the European Union. And now, Sheila, the floor is yours. Merci, Mathias. And thank you to the, the Institut Francais for extending this, this invitation. It's a pleasure to be in conversation with Malcolm. It's not the first time, and it definitely won't be the last. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone, for making it here. Um, also, the, just the sort of the context of the, the English-French relations, I think, are very important to keep up right now when we're embattered by a storm and feeling very isolated here in the UK. Um, so, strange sound. Okay, um, it's kind of hard to know where to begin with this book because it's such an immense and important book um, for so many reasons in terms of the, the historical work it does, but also the conceptual work and the way it opens up into so many issues beyond simply ecology. I mean, the title is A Decolonial Ecology, and the point is that you're thinking the two together, so we're thinking through all kinds of social justice movements, anti-racist movements, anti-colonial, decolonial movements. So um, I wanted to begin with the, the context of this talk, because as many of you are probably aware, you probably booked for the first uh, planned uh, talk, which was back last year in December, I think December. And that was postponed because of Omicron. And then today, this morning, I was really wondering if this would even happen. <laughs> so we have right in front of us these two huge crises, the, the climate crisis um, and the global pandemic. Of course, the two crises are completely linked to histories of colonialism, as your book shows, uh, to extractive capitalism, um, to what we might call epistemologies of the North, a certain way of, of inhabiting the world or looking at the world, power relations in terms of 
access to knowledge. You know, we see this with the, the vaccine apartheid and so on and so forth, and patents and copyrights. So I want to begin with that. Um, and many people have made clear that we need to be thinking these two crises together. So the climate crisis and the global pandemic. So we have people like the scholar Rob Wallace, who's shown that the pandemic arose from the conditions of the, the legacies of pl the plantation system, which is essentially what your, your book is talking about in many ways. The zoonotic spillover comes from industrialized agriculture, deforestation, mass farming of animals, what we might call the sort of uh, <coughs> in animal industrial complex that has to be thought alongside <coughs> the prison industrial complex. So we have that on the one hand, and I think we could come back to that question of what or how we can reread your book in light of COVID um, and all of the sort of problems and inequalities that come with that. <clears throat> but I wanted to sort of pause that and leave that aside for a moment and begin with the storm, because, you know, I, I think it won't have been lost on many of you, <clears throat> the image on the front of this book. For those of you who've seen the book, I'm sure not many of you have yet laid your hands on it because it's just come out, right, in English? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's very striking, this image on the book, which as many of you, of you are probably familiar with, is the image uh, painted by Turner in, I forget the year, I've got it written down, 1840, well done, <laughs> you know your stuff, uh, known as the Zong, uh, but basically the full title is Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying, Typhoon Coming On. So there's a lot to say about this image and it plays a really central role in the beginning of the book. Um, but I wanted to invite you just to sort of bring us into the book because the, the first chapter is about this condition of the storm and to tell us a little bit about the, the importance of the storm as an image and as a kind of operative device um, because the book, I mean, it, it's, so, it's notable for so many reasons, but one being that it's full of these images. I mean, obviously the image of the ship we can come back to um, and images, you know, something like storms, these are images, but they're also experiences that are felt and seen very much differentially according to where one is or who one is according to lines of race and class and so on and so forth. But let's just say telegraphically, we have this image of a storm. It's not a unified image. And I even wanted to invite you to read from the beginning, the first paragraph, um, where is it? just so that people can get a sense, because I'm sure you know some of you would have read the French already. Uh, the translation, I think, is really wonderful. Um, but just to get a sense of the tone, if you'd like to, the first paragraph on page two, and then just to tell us a little bit about how this book begins with the storm and the role of the storm in the book. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I also want to start by thanking the Institute, uh, Matthias, but also the um, Ariel and, and Louise who, who helped make this happen. Um, I want to thank you for being here, uh, especially of, uh, in light of the storm, precisely. And I want to thank Sheila for accepting to, to co-host this, uh, this, this talk. Um, there are many ways I could start uh, with this book. There are many stories to be told. but I, I'll follow along and I'll, I'll read the first, uh, the first paragraph um, with my accent, sorry. But, uh, um, an angry red covers the sky. The waves are rough. The water is rising and the birds are panicking. Swirling winds wrap around the destruction of the Earth's ecosystems. The enslavement of non-humans as well as wars, social inequality, racial discrimination and the domination of women the sixth mass extension of species is, is underway. Chemical pollution is percolating into aquifers and umbilical cords. Climate change is accelerating and global justice remains iniquitous. Violence spreads through the crew. Chained bodies are thrown overboard, sinking into the marine abyss, while brown hands search for hope. The skies thunder loudly. The world ship is in the midst of a modern tempest. In the face of this storm, which finds horizons hidden behind the clouds, vision blurred by the salty waters and cries covered up by unjust gusts, what course can be taken? 
Um, yeah, that's the start. <laughs> I want, of course, uh, the, the storms and, and, the, and the metaphor and the image of a ship work hand in hand. Throughout the book, there is a metaphor that I follow of the world as a ship that is faced with, uh, with different kinds of storms. But, and I, in the description that I start with, you'll see that the storm that I'm talking about is not just an environmental, geological, physical storm, it's also a social, political storm. And I try to, uh, and part of my work is trying to um, get us to see that the both of these are part of one single storm. Um, or one, you know, major storm, and of course this this image is. Um, I think it's there. Are, why did I come with that? First of all, I have to start with the fact that I was born and raised in Martinique, in a in a Caribbean region that is often uh, exposed to different type of storms and especially uh, strong hurricanes and. Uh, and yeah, we have felt these moments when we cannot go outside because of the because of the hurricanes. And you know that because of uh, the global warming, some of these storms are becoming more and more intense. Um, despite the fact that we, I mean, the Caribbean people, have not contributed um, a, a lot to this uh, to, to this global warming. Um, another reason is that I think. Politically, it, it, very, it is very telling um, to see the world as, as a ship facing the storm. And the story of his, of his painting and the story of the song is basically a story of a ship that finds itself, a slave ship that finds itself in a difficult situation and to deal with that situation decides to throw away um, some of the captives with some insurance scheme, thinking that they will get uh, money back if they throw away people instead of trying to ration, they, they were facing a shortage, of, a shortage of water, instead of rationing the water and trying to leave together. And, and that particular story, it's just one story, but there are so many stories like this one that happened throughout the history that are still happening now. And if when you were saying, okay, how can we reread my book in light of COVID-19 and the pandemic? That would be one way. Um, in the way we deal with this crisis, uh, who are we throwing overboard? Who are left aside? And if you recall, at, at least in, 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 it was, that was, first of all, not everybody is equal in facing the storm. <laughs> not everybody is in the same condition. I, 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 I like to say that if we are on the same ship, not everybody in the same condition, and some um, are already shackled inside when the ships are, when when the storm is coming, and you could we, we know that um, the restrictions imposed were uh, harder on people that were, that were already impoverished, already discriminated upon, um, and this image for me, uh, allows us to, to, to ask the question, um, not just how can we get through the storm, but how can we um, face the storm within justice conditions? Um, yeah, that's, that's just um, one way. And politically, especially even in, phil in philosophy, the, um, even um, um, uh, Many people have used the, the, the metaphor, and someone com like Paul Gilroy, also in terms of the Black Atlantic, mobilizes this 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 ship. And I think it's just, yeah, it, it sometimes it talks to people. If if you look at some of the uh, classical uh, environmental theory, they would use another type of ship, the, the Noah's Ark. So, and, and I'm in conversation with that that uh, that, that history. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the ships, but I also just staying in the present moment. Um, I was thinking about when we first met, and it was in J June 2020 uh, in Paris, and it was actually at the uh, Museum of Immigration. Is that what it's now called? Yeah. Uh, yeah yes. Yeah. And it was a uh, it was an event that was organized, basically a balade de colonial that was organized by various a coalition of anti-racist groups, who were part of a kind of uh, increasing um, 
uh, set of demands to remove uh, statues from public space that depict either slavers or somehow make reference to slavery or colonialism. And I mention this because I think it's really important, even though we're talking about <coughs> supposedly ecology, to think about those debates around what happens in public space, who gets to have a voice, who has the space to make certain demands and who's seen in these socio-political debates. Um, and also because I think, to me, certainly, <clears throat> reading the book, what's very strong is an element of protest and an element of resistance and those sort of minor voices who are making these demands and, and in the second half of the book are basically these leading figures in terms of how we might sort of build this world ship that you talk about and, and find and then eventually build this, this bridge and we can come to that in terms of sort of finding our way out of the storm. So we have this element of protest, which I think is very present. And I also wanted to mention, um, continuing from the, the introduction, that uh, Malcolm very kindly joined us this morning for a teach out uh, at Goldsmiths. I have to say that I'm currently on strike. I'm an academic. As with many academics around the country, we're taking uh, a number of days of industrial action. And whilst this might seem to be digressing, it's, in my opinion, very, very much related to your book. Um, because basically what you're saying is we can't be dealing with issues of environmental justice, climate justice, social justice. Well, we can't be dealing with issues of environmental justice without all those other elements. And we can't be teaching, for instance, decolonial ecology in the university without thinking about workers' rights and the conditions of both staff and the students who are paying an absolute fortune and becoming hugely indebted in order to be consumers of knowledge. Um, and also thinking about the sort of broader environment of decolonizing the curriculum or decolonizing XYZ as happens here in the UK and also abroad. Thinking about the sort of problematics in the way in which these terms of social justice, environmental justice, so on and so forth, is very easy. There's a huge risk of these terms getting co-opted by institutions. Uh, and becoming basically a marketing tool. So this is something that I've seen with my own eyes. I mean, I could go on about that for ages, but that, that would be to di digress too much. Um, but I think there's two, there's two main issues here. So we have A, that question of who gets to occupy public space. Um, and I'm thinking of my colleague at uh, Goldsmiths, Niamal Pua, who has a book called Space Invaders. So space invaders being deviants from what she calls the somatic norm, or bodies that are marked out as trespassers who are in accordance with how both space and bodies are imagined, so politically, historically, and conceptually, described as being out of place. <clears throat> and then we have the ways in which institutions potentially appropriate these issues of social justice and environmental justice. So for my question, I want to focus on the latter and just get you to sort of lead the audience into one of the main issues of the book being the, the sort of risks you see in the environmental movement um, and the problematics of that that you've identified historically back through the whole sort of history of conservation, for instance, but also importantly for us right now in the present day. So what are the kind of blind spots of environmentalism and maybe you could use <clears throat> that as a way to explain this sort of double fracture that your work has been become quite known for, just to give the audience a sort of a taster of that. Um, sure. Um, so I start my book by, uh, I mean, the, the, the introduction really is about what I've termed the double, uh, the double fracture of modernity. It is essentially the, the kind of gap between uh, concepts and activism and, and vertical engagement with, on the one side, the environment, the ecology, the, the ecosystems and the, the way they are changing, and on the other, uh, dealing with issues of uh, social justice, uh, with the legacy of the colonial uh, colonization and colonial slavery, slavery. And growing up in Martinique, I, I had an interest in both of these issues. I was interested in both in the way we, we inhabit the earth, the way we deal with the environment, and especially growing up on a small island, any kind of um, environmental destruction has a strong impact uh, very quickly. 
And but growing up in Martinique is also a place where you start to realize that um, there are differences in the way people are uh, treated, in the way people are equipped because of their skin color, because of the way they look. And especially as a child, you don't really understand it uh, right away. But even if, even though I had an interest in both of these fields, both of these issues, I was taught to perceive them as being completely and totally separate. On the one hand, you want to do, um, you know, environmental stuff, environmental studies, and actually, part of my degree in, in here in UCL, but uh, was dealing with the um, with the environment. But I was still focused also on understanding how the society I came in was to become so marginalized within France. You know, as you know, Martinique is part of the French Outre-mer. And, um, and in the imaginary of what France is, the Outre-mer are still being uh, most of the time forgotten. If, if, for example, you have to draw a map of France, you will draw the hexagon, and that's it. And maybe Corsica, you know. And, but then you forget about, uh, about two, three million people. You forget about 80% of the biodiversity of France and 97% of its marine areas. France now is the second marine power in the world behind the States. And the reason why is because of the Outre-mer. Places that are uh, socially, uh, there is a lot of inequality, there is a lot that t t uh, twice to three times higher unemployment and a lot of other issues. But so I was, I, was, I was taught to perceive them as being two separate uh, issues. And, and this is something I've encountered throughout my studies in uh, environmental philosophy or political ecology, both in the academia, but also in the activist field. So when I went to uh, meet up with uh, environmental NGOs in France or you know, going to conferences, I was usually one of the only black person there, and more, more so one of the only black French person. So it would be okay to bring someone from Cameroon, to bring someone from far away, but and and that um, and I found there was a big contradiction here, because here you have a group of people, person, movement that try to really articulate a thought about what it means to live or inhabit the earth, uh, what has been happening throughout the history, what's going to happen uh, longer. But yet, when we try to imagine this earth and imagine this world, we do this in a space that is less diverse than what the society is. So when then what world can be imagined if, if part of the people that people this world is left aside, is, is left ashore. And um, so there is, of, of course, uh, and this is a danger for many reasons. One of the reasons that I'm sure a lot of you have heard is that you get the belief that ecological issues become the, the property of a domain of certain people. So I've heard some of my friends from countries in Africa saying, well, Malcolm, ecology is a white thing, you know, we, we have different things to deal with, etc., etc." And that is a danger. Why? Because then um, certain questions and certain issues are being uh, neglected, in a sense. And what you were referring to in terms of uh, occupying spaces or invading spaces, I think can be true about uh, certain concepts. Concepts of like the human, what it means to be human. That's what uh, Sylvia Winter, a great uh, thinker, used to say, that human is an occupied territory as a concept. And that there is a need to reclaim it. There's a need to, for people that have been excluded from what it means to be human to reclaim it and, and, and redefine and, 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 and uh, formulate um, um, humanity or humanness. And the same can be true about ecology. There's a need for, uh, to, to reclaim and, and not leave this uh, ecological conceptualization to certain groups, in, in usually higher education or you know, certain countries in the north, etc. Et 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 um, and starting from this divide, from this double fracture, that's the start of my book, the rest of the book is really about trying to find ways in which we can move beyond that divide. So I am in constant conversation with what I call a classical genealogy of ecological thinking, 
uh, with their own concepts, grammar, concepts like the Anthropocene, for example, the geological era in which we're supposed to be in. Uh, but I think even though it's interesting, that sometimes has some blind spot in terms of social issues, in terms of the legacy of colonialism, colonialism and slavery as well. And I suggest other avenues, I suggest other ways uh, in, with, in which we can think of these issues together and provide uh, perspective policies, uh, policy stories and concepts that maybe um, offer a different way of inhabiting the world, the, the earth, a different way of creating uh, um, uh, a world between, between humans, with non-humans. I mean, basically changing the way we've been doing things. <laughs> for the last 500, uh, 500 years. Yeah, thank you, and, and that actually was gonna be my next question, that that issue of um, reclaiming or providing other avenues, whatever image we want to use. I mean, there's a lot of sense of building, building a, a bridge, for instance, or making worlds in the book. Um, and I'm just thinking of sort of the experience of teaching, like I'm always saying to my students, when you write essays, we're doing two things. You've got first the diagnosis, second the intervention. The diagnosis is really important, but then if you just stop there, well, what are we doing, right? And the book really is structured, it seems, you know, you've got these four parts, and the first two, you've got the modern tempest, you're laying out the sort of history of environmental violence and colonial ruptures, as you've just explained. Second part is Noah's Ark, and then when environmentalism refuses the world, so again, the sort of problematics of environmentalism. And then the third part, the slave ship rising up from modernity's hold in search of a world. So you're already there's this sort of movement in search of something else and a kind of reclamation of what was the potential there in the most dire of spaces. And so it's not to romanticize that by any means, but already you know, basically you're saying that the, the a kind of kernel of a decolonial ecology was already there in a space that we don't expect to be finding decolonial ecology, or ecology, let's say. And then the fourth part is a world ship, world making beyond the double fracture. So those two second parts are really important in terms of kind of constructing alternatives or reclaiming, as you say. So I wonder if you can just quickly sort of schematically guide the audience in terms of that movement through these four, uh, four kinds of ships. So you've got the modern tempest, obviously with the Zong, as is on the cover. Then you've got the Noah's Ark. <clears throat> And then the slave ship, and then a world ship. So if you can just whiz through those to give people a sense of that kind of narrative arc, which is so important for the book. Um, it, it, it might sound tr strange maybe to, to, to some people saying, well, we're talking about ecology, and you have all these images about ships, about storms, about, you know, w w what has this to do with it? I think it has everything to do with it because, um, our concepts, our languages, our grammar, the, 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 the way we speak um, are embedded in an imaginary of the world. The imaginary this is, is like this, 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 this that made the image possible. And um, so the first part, as, as I started, of the, so the book has four parts, as you said. The first part is really about describing the storm. Des describing the storm in a way that is that is not just the environmental storm, not just the social political storm, but describing the storm. And then I ask at the end of this first part, okay, there is a storm coming. What type of ship, metaphorically, are we going to build to face the storm? And then the second part, I um, study the the metaphorical ship of environmentalism. Um, and I'm specifically looking at a, a type of environmentalism. Um, some can say that it started in the in the 19th century with the with the uh, the creation of the first preservation parks in the states and elsewhere. Um, but then, when you look at some of the major theorists, people like Paul Crutzen, who, who coined the term Anthropocene, people like even um, uh, Michel Serres, who um, well, wrote this book called the Natural Contract. Um, there is a, um, an imaginary that they use to uh, explain to to uh, explain their concepts, and the imaginary they use is that of Noah's Ark. 
uh, there has been uh, an excess of evil or you know something on earth there is rain coming down the water is rising and that metaphor seems to play perfectly with the climate change global warming but then i have nothing to say about the old testament story but when we use that metaphor politically it becomes a problem because the metaphor of noah's ark is a metaphor of selection actually and a violent selection when you look at it a metaphor of looking at who gets to get on the Noah's Ark, on, 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 on ship, who gets to board, and who and what is left aside, uh, ashore. And of course, this metaphor has no political um, uh, content. It's just about getting on board, but we don't know how we live, how all of these, all of these animals, all these people will live inside the ship. Um, and of course, this creates a number of problems. And I think looking at the ecological crisis only in terms of environments, you may overlook other type of problems, including social issues, including uh, gender uh, discrimination, racial issues also. So that's one hand. The third part, I suggest a shift. See, if you look at most of the, let's say, anthologies of ecological writing, even today, some of these that are published today, you will have two names that are usually talked about, uh, Rousseau in, in the French context in the 18th century and uh, Henri David Thoreau. These are like the first, and, and they are, you know, and, and this is what I call the genealogy of ecological thinking. And genealogy, when you think about it, is a very selective uh, action. So you decide from whom you inherit, but you also decide from whom you do not inherit. And so you have a movement, an environmental movement, that decided that, okay, our forefathers, fathers, of course, are two men uh, in post-colonial and post-slavery societies that wrote pieces about nature in so-called so -called pristine nature. It, places in which, so Rousseau was walking around different forests in France and Switzerland, and Henri David Toro was walking around the Walden, Walden Pond. And they are seen as being the founders of uh, environmental thinking. And yet, when you look at what were the scene, what were the social political scene from which they write, it's seen where they are uh, alone in nature and in an uh, asocial relation with nature. So they're not gathering collectively, doing rituals, they're not eating. Uh, Thoreau is a different story. Um, and yet, my point was at the same time, in the very moment that Rousseau was walking around the forest of Montmorency in the same time that Toro was walking around Walden Pond. There were people in shackles in the hold of slave ships that also inhabited the earth, that also had a thinking, that also had an idea of what it means to be on this earth, of what it means to inhabit the world. And they also had desires, they also had voices, they also had concepts, ideas about how we could do better. And so the shift is, I, I wanted to situate myself in the hold of a slave ship and try to think, okay, how can I face the storm from that, metaphorically? And I suggest different avenues and, and different stories. So I pay attention, for example, to the uh, story of the Maroons, the people that fled the plantations and tried to uh, inhabit secluded places, including hills, mountains, swamps making an opposition, an opposition to both the enslavement, the capture of their body, the control of their body, but also an opposition to this violent way of inhabiting the land, which is the plantation. They were creating different types of gardens in which there was a mixture of crops, uh, animals, and it was not this standardized exportation crops of cotton, sugarcane, indigo, and other things. And so that's the, that, that's the shift in the third part. And the fourth part is really trying to envision what would be, what would be a, a, a truly world ship, not a Noah's Ark, not a safe ship, but a ship where we can face the, the, the tempest while encountering one another, both human and non-human, because we don't inhabit the earth only between human beings. And how, what would it look like? How would we write? What kind of aesthetics? What kind of ontology would we need? Um, what, what type of justice would we require for such a ship to really uh, take place?
Thank you. I mean, I, I have a big question about justice, but first of all, I wanted to come back to the present moment and what you were saying about the sort of forefathers and the problematic of this kind of canon. Um, and it's also a question of terminology because you distinguish, you don't use the term environmentalism, it's a decolonial ecology because environmentalism can potentially signify like the environment as something out there, right? Whereas ecology can be very much in terms of urban contexts and it's much more expansive. Um, so coming back to, for instance, that the balade de colonial that we were at, you know, that's a question of ecology there. We're in the middle of a city and yet we're thinking about all these issues. And also since COVID issues of uh, cleanliness of air, for instance, and living conditions and access to green space within the urban environment, uh, obviously since the murder of George Floyd, but also before the question of a kind of economy of breath is central to the question of race um, and class. But then coming back to that question of, uh, you know, citations, who gets named, who is included in the canon, in the context of academia, I mean, that's where I'm speaking from, this is obviously really, really urgent right now. And it's not just a question of kind of adding in a few thinkers from the global south or kind of colorizing the curriculum. I think what your book does, does so well is to show the historical roots of why this story of environmentalism was written in a certain way and why these single white male figures who are in the wilderness which itself you know as you were talking about earlier today is premised upon genocide um, why they're the ones who are the the main um, the main proper names basically um, and I wanted to get to the current moment in France around the sort of conjunction between anti-racist activism uh, and struggles and environmental struggles, but sort of taking a detour through the UK and also the US, because obviously the book has this forward by Angela Davis, which in itself is already just important. The, prop the existence of the proper name there is important for signaling issues of race and gender as well, and abolition, which is something I, I can come to if we have time. Um, and she's saying how, she's very honestly saying, you know, there were people decades ago who were working in the environmental justice struggle in the name of, in, in, in order to counter environmental racism, who were diagnosing that, and her and others perhaps weren't taking them as seriously at that time as they should have done. And now she realizes, as do many others, that the two need to be addressed hand in hand. And I'm thinking of, for instance, here in the UK, there was, in 2016, there was an action led by some members of Black Lives Matter where they tried to shut down City Airport to draw attention to environmental racism and to, to draw attention to the polluting effects um, of that airport in an area, there's Newham right next door, that's very impoverished and that has many racialized uh, communities. And at the time, actually, the Black Lives Matter broader movement, this was 2016, really hit back at them and were saying, why are you you know, wasting your time, basically? I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there was that reaction. Why are you dealing with these issues of environmentalism? That's for white middle class people. We've got other much more urgent things to deal with. And it's interesting how now in, you know, it's not just this year, there's been a last couple of years where in the public consciousness, it's there's much more awareness that we have to be dealing with these things together. So there's many groups, um, I'm thinking of the Wretched of the Earth, or Land in Our Names, or Black Geographers. I mean, I could go on, and I think it is important to name these people. Uh, there's Black Outside, Carol Wright, who's working here in London, who are really bringing this to public attention. And I just wanted to ask you a bit about how this is playing out in France right now, because obviously we have the problematic of the term decolonial, which you were talking about earlier today with the students. Um, and I'm thinking about the, the annual march pour Adama. So Adama Traoré, who was murdered, well, killed in police custody um, in 2016, and his death is basically what sparked the, the uprisings against police brutality and, and anti-black brutality. And actually last year there was, I think for the first time, but obviously you know much better, at the marsh there were environmentalist groups there. And so that you see this kind of beginnings of 
these two fields, these two camps coming together. Um, and, you know, that was also met, met with resistance, and you can see on social media commentaries going, you know, this has got nothing to do with environmentalism. You know, Adam Atraore would have turned in his grave, you know, and, and you can understand some of those reactions, but so I want to sort of get a sense of how that looks right now in France. Um, yes, the, the, the issue of who gets to speak, who gets to, to talk, uh, you know, it's, it's about certain issues is, is, is very important. Uh, a, a quick anecdote, um, we, for example, someone like Henry David Thoreau is known for two things, for Walden, but also for his opposition to slavery. He's a very interesting figure. And then he's celebrated like, yeah, he, he's opposed to, especially the fugitive, the fugitive slave law that happened where the, the northern state had to bring back the fugitive in the southern states in the state. And then we forget, how did this person become so interested in slavery? Well, his mother and his aunt were part of the women against, uh, against slavery, or women for the abolition of slavery. And then when we talk about Thoreau, we forget the part played by these women in his life that led him to write some of these issues. So this is a, an example of some people that are erased from the, from, from the picture. And thinking about erasure, the starting point is that this book was written within the French context, which made it a bit harder because some terms like decolonial, like race, like uh, black and white, there is something difficult or more difficult to even use these terms, regardless of what you would say about them, within the French context, because you are perceived to be anti-republican, anti-secularism, if you use them within, within the French academia. And that's, for me, uh, so wrong, because uh, you have people who simply want to study, trying to find the best theory to understand, problematize, find solutions to situations, and, and they can't. And, and even when I was finishing my book, I was hesitant to use this title because I knew, and that happened a few times, but I knew that by the single title, people would be saying, well, you know, we shouldn't read that, etc., etc. Et but I was thinking, well, this is what I'm talking about, so it has to be this, and just let's, let's, let's go with it. Um, and um, the, since the publication, 2019, along with other publication and other movements, there are two things happened. There is, of course, the, the uh, COVID crisis, but there was also the, the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, which kind of gave an additional spark to this committee for Adama Traoré uh, uh, in, in France. And when you say, when you mention issues about air pollution, um, there is a almost political relation with air regarding black bodies in the sense that the fact that um, so many of police brutality have been caused with the prevention of air being entering the airways of black bodies. Um, and so alliances were made in line with this decolonial ecology, with, with this, this idea that we need to think together environment, air pollution, but also anti-racism, uh, social equality, gender equality, and so on and so forth. Um, um, and so movements like Adama Traoré, uh, the Committee for Adama Traoré, gathered, and I think it was uh, two years ago, not necessarily this year, I'm not sure, maybe it was last year, but I'm not exactly sure. But they gathered and, and um, in this yearly march they join together with the Committee for Adama Traoré and another ecological movement called Alternatiba under the same motto saying, um, uh, we want to breathe. We want to breathe. We want the right to breathe. Um, um, to both not being subjected to chokehold from the police, but also not to be subjected to air pollution when where, where we live. Um, and I think it's just one initiative that points to a very uh, interesting directions in, in the movement. But you have other initiatives like uh, the collective uh, Front des Mers, uh, who uh, initiate a different um, point source of ecological discourse as a urban or popular ecology from the impoverished suburb. So the Front des Mers is a, a syndicate of mothers uh, 
uh, but you know we can talk a bit more about this. And one other thing that happened after this book is it was published in French. In France, is that um, I went to many conferences and, and I met people from the overseas territories that were interested in that subject as well. And so we created a um, an NGO. Uh, we call ourselves the World Earth Observatory, where we try to work on these ecological issues from with, from the perspective of the overseas territories and the surrounding regions. So there are initiatives where um, you can see that. In a way, the, both the language and the ecological scene in France is changing, is shifting. Now you have uh, Fatima Wasak and Le Comité Adama that, is, that are invited, whether they come or not, to some uh, green days in, in, in France. Now there is a, a sense that we can no longer maintain these spaces that are so that that, that are in need of diversity the way they are the, the, the way they, they used to go. So this is, I think, a very promising uh, movement. Thanks. I'm just looking at time. Um, I have so many questions, so I've had to pick one because we're going to open up, right? Yeah. yeah. So can I ask one more question? Pressing one. Um, the, I mean, if you read about the, the Comité Adama and the Marche pour Adama, like often you see the, the term of paying homage to, to Adama, but also to rendre justice, to, like, to demand justice. And this is something that is prevalent throughout your book, the term justice. And I'm not going to ask you the big, big question of like, what is it or, or what would it be look like or how would it be performed. But, well, I kind of am, sorry. Um, and. I want you to speak a little bit more. Um, towards the end, you have this idea of this world ship, building this world ship, um, and it's a, a world ship's bridge to justice. You also insert it being sort of transgenerational, so that's another element of it. Um, and you talk about various demands from people's movements and the issue of restitution and reparation. So justice is very expanded in your sense, which I completely agree with. Um, and then you mentioned things like the rights of nature um, and some legal cases, for instance, in Holland. And I'm thinking of sort of a specific case to give you a bit more focus. I'm thinking of the um, drafting last year of a definition, a legal definition of ecocide drafted by various lawyers around the world. So ecocide being the kind of crime against the environment, like genocide, but carried out across against the environment, which of course is a way of, of violating human rights. You, you know, violate the, the conditions in which people live and their life worlds. So obviously, you're violating human rights, so the two are very, very uh, interlinked. So let's say this definition did get taken up by the International Criminal Court, which is the aim, and you had a criminal trial putting on trial, let's say, a corporation for the crimes of ecocide that are very carefully defined. Would that then be justice? Or is there another sense of justice that you're aiming for with the book, which I, I think you are, um, and I thought maybe, because there was a recent article of yours where you're saying, this is in Cultural Anthropology Journal last year, where you're talking about the necessity to understand something like ecocide through slavery and through colonization and through these lived histories that you talk about and that you insert into the book through your own story and through sort of embodied experiences and different cultural forms. So yeah, I want you to just say a little bit about like how to, to demand justice in relation to legal frameworks. So, uh, yeah, this is a very short question, right? <laughs> so I think the ecological crisis uh, pushes us to challenge our classical understanding of politics, understanding of justice, what it means. Um, and this is just one element of that. Now, we need to go back to the start. The start, I talked about this double fracture environmental, post-colonial, colonial, and terrorist, and so on and so forth. And I look at justice as being subjected to this same double fracture, in the sense that there are some leeway we will agree with the environment, some we will not agree with, for example, the legacy of colonization. Let me give you one example. Um, when, when you look at environmental justice in the technical term or um, 
initiatives like the Kyoto Protocol or, or even like the Paris Climate Ag uh, Agreement, we want, it, it is a kind of transgenerational justice in the sense that we want to deal with emissions that happened in the past, the gases that are there, the, the greenhouse gases that are emitted today will still warm the earth a few years, I mean a few decades from now actually. And so there are all these measures that are put in place basically to deal with the past, to deal with the crimes of the past as long as they they are uh, part of a quote-unquote environmental issue. But when we want to do the same thing with issues of, uh, you know, colonization, uh, genocide or slavery, it becomes a problem. Uh, that's why you have uh, a bunch, a number of demands today about uh, reparation for slavery, uh, you know, reparation for different types of colonization. But yet these demands are not looked at the same way as the demands for environmental reparation, for example. And there is a kind of a discrepancy. And um, I simply call for a more coherent understanding of what justice means. And a, a, di a big difference that ones need to make is between the idea of justice and the way the idea of justice is being translated into concrete technical juridical laws measures and you know so in a sense um, and i think they are important but and that the idea of justice will never be totally uh, uh, encompassed within one single draft or one single law and that's why we always change law and that's you know, the idea of the, law, of the law. But what is the point of justice? Why do we need justice? Be besides recognizing the dignities of people that have been uh, wronged, one of the points to me, and that's why I, I, I speak about a bridge of justice, is that it allows to create a space where we have to recognize that we have something in common. A space where we can disagree, a space, but when we talk about a common history. And that's a way in which we can encounter one another. Because one can say that colonization, especially the European colonization from uh, 1492 and so on in the Americas, is a, f a failed encounter where the inhuman condition required uh, made it impossible to, to look at one another and see another human or see another person. And so, to me, the, the way we respond to that is not necessarily an, uh, a response in which everybody will stand on, on, on our own respective corners of the earth. We can't do that because we inhabit one earth. So the question becomes, under what condition the, the, the anti-colonial, decolonial practice becomes, under what condition can we encounter one another? And I think justice is a precondition for an encounter. And this has been used, for example, in, 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 um, in the way we deal in the aftermath of, of uh, genocide from born in South Africa or, or, in the, or in Rwanda. I'm not saying that they are perfect, of course not, but these common scenes where we talk about the history, where we, where we recognize that, that we share something, I think justice can do that. And, and we need to do that both with respect to the environment, but also with respect to the way uh, the earth has been inhabited, ex especially by colonized, co colonization and, and, and slavery. So not to be uh, uh, calling for repentance, but laying the ground for a different story of the earth, laying the ground for a different world making. I think that's, that's, uh, that's the idea at least. <laughs> Thanks. And yeah, in the book you, you sort of stress the importance of discursive spaces. So I think those spaces for different forms of expression and yeah. storytelling are really important. I just saw Carol Wright walk in. I did name you earlier, just so you know. <laughs> um, I guess we open it up at this point. And I mean, it would be nice to hear about what's happening in, in Martinique and Guadeloupe in terms of COVID and so and the Clodocone, obviously. Um, but over to the audience. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting and really sort of inspiring as well. 
As it happens, towards the end, I think you started to answer the question that I'm about to ask, but I wonder if we could pick it up and sort of unpack it a little bit more. I'm quite interested in the sort of metaphor of the ship and the double fracture, because I'm wondering whether there is also a bit of a fracture within that metaphor to some extent, insofar as a ship sort of implies travel, destination, where we're going. And I think the decolonial part of it has the potential to start to bring in voices about where that destination ought to be. And I'm sort of thinking of something I read at the beginning of the pandemic by um, Michael Murtha Krishna, who talked about um, one of the challenges of ecology being um, the idea of prevention. But actually, might there be another sort of thing to consider, um, which is preparation, which somewhat does a ship, the metaphor of a ship, does, you know, does that sort of take us away from, because it's still about destination and travel, but I'm wondering about the preparation for what happens, for example, when, if Bangladesh, for example, is subsumed and there's a mass migration, are India, Pakistan, the sort of that, that South Asian region, are they prepared for what that will mean? How do we begin also shifting the dial to not just about a destination that we want to arrive at, but also preparing mm. ourselves? And I'm wondering how other voices, because clearly that's that's the decolonial part of it, how, how do we bring those other voices to also bear upon preparations, solutions, mitigations, or, or, or et cetera? So, so we go one question by one, one question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if, um, I, I I don't know your name, but thank you for your for your question. Uh, um, so one of the one of the arguments of the book is also to shift the focus from an understanding of the ecological the ecological crisis as solely a matter of the environment. Um, and in a sense, we are taking measures to curb or limit. Some countries are, some countries are not. The greenhouse gas emission and to limit the sea level rise. Um, and as I say often, even though this is the matter of a number of policies, the sole imperative to limit carbon emission, to me, does not carry any political content. That means it does not say anything about the way we live together or the way we inhabit the earth together. And the danger is when we shift away that, that from that questions and only focus on the very technical um, uh, goal that we can achieve and we can measure 350 part per, per, per million or so on and so forth. And so when we look at migration, because it's, it is true that some countries that are low-lying will be subjected to sea level rise and that there will be mass migration, but there are already migration now. And the question is, if we are unwilling to, um, to show hospitality to the migrants today, uh, what's to say that we will do it any differently because they are you know, climate refugees? And so um, there, was, there was this example that I take that happened two months ago. You had the COP26 uh, and you have this <laughs> And, and you have the, um, the, the, the Minister of the Environment of uh, Lulang Atoll that uh, made a, a very powerful speech knee deep in seawater calling for the curbing of greenhouse emission. And uh, around the same time, you had uh, the, the shipwreck of about 20 or 25 migrants in the English Channel. And I like to remind that it is, even if some, somehow magically we could limit sea level rise today, people will still be drowning because of social inequalities, because of the legacy of colonization. And so, as if you only have the, um, the, uh, the imperative to limit, or the, the technical imperative, but not looking at how we build the world together, you create the, the possibility, like the Zong, that in the end we still overthrow people, uh, throw people overboard. So when you talk about Preparation. Of course, there are some measures. If you have some, you know, uh, you know, I forgot the name, dikes and those. To, to, but the real preparation is creating a just world today, so that as the changing changes happen, 
we, we develop a habit of treating with dignity people, whether they are the, uh, you know, of course, because migrations will happen, whether there is changes in the environment or not. And so the question is, how can we create conditions to, to, um, to host, to, to show hospitality to, to, to the migrants today, <laughs> and especially the migrants of yesterday? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Matt Sadiso. Um, I've bought your book, I've started your book, but I haven't finished your book. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, because you're from Martinique, you studied in this country, but you work in France. I'm um, born here, but I'm half South African. I lived in Paris and I'm half Jamaican. And I wonder whether your experience of blackness in all these iterations has impacted, how it's impacted your view of ecology, because I think blackness is different in all these different places. Well, Maybe you don't <laughs> think so, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I, so for sure. Um, and, uh, and it's just, it's not just the experience of blackness, it's also the experience of citizenship. Um, so, um, in the UK, I was so I, when I started at UCL and I was joining some clubs like a basketball club, I realized that you had to put your you know ethnicity, <laughs> something you never do in France. Um, and then um, that that, but I was when I came to the UK in was a long time ago, I was presently surprised by the kind of diversity you could see in in, in the city. Um, and of course, I would find friends from Nigeria, from Ghana, and uh, I was actually um, the president of the African Caribbean Society of, of UCL at some point, and, and we would host. And, and there was a kind of community there that, uh, that even though we are from different countries, we felt some, some sort of shared experience. Um, if you do this in France, sometimes you are being called a communitarian and, and you, know, you are a threat to, 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 to the Republic. And if I want to go to, when I went to the States, uh, some, sometimes in France I'm called a, a Métis, mixed, mixed race. Uh, in the States I'm black, in, the, in Brazil I'm Moreno. Um, in South Africa I don't know, but I would like to go there. Um, and so there are, of course, depending on the society you are in, you'll be, you'll, you'll, there will be different, um, um, different way to categorize what you look like and, and your experience. But I did feel that and especially when you look at who gets to be cited in books, uh, whether men, women, people of color or not, I did feel that there was a common thread in which I could not, I was interested in the environment and yet all the imaginary, all the history of my ancestors, of the people that I met in Ghana or somewhere, were, were somehow erased. So it, it's, it's, it's really as if you were trying, to, because ecology is about a story of the earth. So that's why stories are important. What type of stories and narratives are you going to tell about Europe in, in, in the facing of ecological issues? And how come certain people are being erased from that story? So that's, that's why um, I think maybe there's a common thread here. And, and that's why I've been inspired by people like Wangari Maathai from Kenya, people like, uh, um, um, she's a candidate now in, in Colombia, Francia Marquez, um, but yeah. People like uh, Ken Sao, we are people, people like Jacques Roumain in Haiti. Uh, um, and, and I think there are there many, I'm, I'm just calling for a plurality of voices. Uh, you know, I'm not saying there is one voice that is more important than the other, but yet to this day, there is voices that are not heard. Yeah, there are voices. Hello, I'm Juliette. Um, I think I have a long question that would start with um, the idea of um, when you talked about the difference and the, the difference you felt between the social justice and the environment, I thought about eco-feminism uh, and the fact that, uh, for example, Vantana Shiva has linked for 
a while those two fields uh, saying, well, you can't talk about environment if you don't talk about uh, feminism and you have to respect the human being before trying to respect nature because you obviously human being is part of nature. So, and I'm thinking also in, in USA right now when you, where you have the indigenous people being part of the decisions and trying to make their voice being heard. So my questions would be, would, do you think that it's a specifically European thing not to link uh, environment and social justice? And the second part would be, um, do you think uh, we can be taken on board on this, this ship? Because I'm talking, for example, about uh, women, and we, I think, will be on the arch, <laughs> we will be on, the bo on board, but not in the right conditions and sometimes not for the good reasons. So do you think inside the storm there can be a storm as well on the boat itself? Um, so thank, thank you for your question and, and I'll start with the, with the latter part. Um, of course, of course, and that's, I think that, that has been a blind side of environmentalism, thinking that all, all that matters is that everybody gets, gets on board. But I think it is important what ha what's happening on the ship. Because that's that. This is how we're going to veer or decide which course to take. And of course, uh, the images of a slave ship is exactly to point out that um, whether there is a storm or not, some people will still be in the hold, whether they are women or people of color, etc., etc. Regarding Vandana Shiva, she's always linked this issue, but she's also a very fervent, we could say, decolonial thinker. She 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 fervently criticizes colonization. And um, there is something, I wouldn't say European, but at least specifically French, about the reception of environmental justice. See, environmental justice is a concept and a movement that started in the US, especially in opposition to what they term environmental racism. And so the, the scholars and the activists, and especially a lot of women, f uh, termed environmental justice as a way to denounce and oppose and show something else. Uh, especially when they were exposed to toxics, etc. Et et and that concept and movement had some uh, echoes in the UK. But when it came to France, surprisingly, the term environmental justice, especially in 2010, w was not uh, important. We were thinking about uh, ecological or environmental inequalities. The term justice had gone. And now that the term environmental justice is talked about, the, the foundations, the, the anti-racist foundation has been pushed aside. They say, well, and when you look, when you read some, some books, they say, well, okay, these concepts start in the States, you know, where there are racism. Uh, and then, in, in, and then in, in France, it's something else, we just, you know, differences between who gets access to what, to what, to what. And so there was a question that was lost. And now, even though, even, even now there is a, a currency to a, a tendency to to um, perceive environmental justice as a field of law, with you know what measures what how we're going to write this article, which is important. It's, it's part of the way we create societies, of course. But the the um, the ideas that it, it's a way to to change our modes of inhabitation and to bring on board people that have been wrong, people that have been dehumanized to this day. That's something we should, we should, uh, we, we should change, and, and that's what I call for in, in, also in the book. That's something I forgot to say. I think the, the uh, presence of acknowledgement of black feminist thought in the book is quite striking. I forgot to mention it. In the spirit of what was started, I'm Dubravka. It's difficult to pronounce. You can call me Dubi. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it's, it, I've been thinking with the kind of whole ship. Just before coming here, I read about this absolutely crazy news that there is a, a cargo ship uh, on fire somewhere in around Azores, full of Volkswagen Bentleys, and uh, where the whole crew kind of disembarked uh, and is safe but the cars are burning. Apparently there are some Bentleys and Porsches. And then like, uh, and I, and I was of course thinking about this other ship from last year, which blocked the canal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and actually, so with, 
And then thinking about how one of the fundamental things that is happening in ex-Yugoslavia, where I'm, where I'm coming from, uh, is that the politi new political imagination that is now present in, in Zagreb and is hopefully going to emerge is, and is emergent in, in Belgrade really came from the moment in which cultural activists asking for in kind of spaces for independent culture and started to use uh, this concept of right to the city started to join forces with the e ecological activists which uh, like the green the green activism in in Croatia which was always kind of framed around not around conservation but around we have to bring people aboard and not just preserve mm. her, her nature and how through this, certain new imaginaries imagine, em, em, emerged, in which it was possible to transcend that, that this impulse that exists within that specific um, region, that uh, any language that is familiar to the kind of to the to what was what is called Yugo socialism becomes the language that is distancing from the thinking the world, different worlds of modes of being, even though what is being lived is obviously not what people necessarily want. So the image on your, uh, the, the Turner painting on your, on your, uh, on the, your cover is in the realm of what Shella used called diagnosis. Mm -hmm. so, so what are the imaginaries and how do we create these imaginaries? And what for you are these places where new imaginaries are emerging in which allow kind of to bring people into this you know. So, um, well, th thank you for the question. Um, and it is true that I gave a form to this, uh, so the, the form of a slave ship, I talked about the form of Thomas Ark, but I have not given a form of the world ship. And, and so I have not, um, or if I were to give one right now, it would be, um, I, I don't know, the, the French world is uh, in bark, but I know the, 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 the word in, in, in English. It's basically, it's basically a, a ship without a hold. A ship without a hold. A ship where you don't put either, neither animals, neither um, you know, beings or that, that would be you know, hidden from the views. And, and that, that, that would be one image. And actually, Edouard Glissant, a, a, a thinker from, from, from Martinique, um, when he talks about slavery, he says that, and talk about the, the encounter of the slave ship by some Africans, he said, well, that in their imaginary, the, the, the ships did not have a hold. What? The, the, the ships did not have a hold. And um, really, when I talk about the holds of the hold of modernity, I talk not, of, of course, it's a, it's a specific ship, the slave ship, but I talk about a political, social political disposition that will hide the people but I would uh, overlook some, some people. And one of the reasons I did not give one form because I didn't want to dictate, and, and it's not my place to dictate how we should go about building this ship. And of course, I think there should be many types of ships uh, that are conducive to world making. And the, 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 the title in France is A Decolonial Ecology, which, which, which means that, and, and I, at, at least I, I situate myself within what I call the Caribbean world, but I'm mindful that there are different imaginary and different starting points of possible uh, decolonial ecology. And I think in Eastern Europe also that could be different because there are different types of coloniality that can happen even here in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Asia and somewhere else. And there's a need to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be more universalist than the universalist. Uh, I don't think you answer, even when I criticize the Anthropocene, um, I don't say, okay, use the term plantationocene, negrocene, capitalocene, instead of, I'm saying they should be there as well. The problem is that there is one term that dominates all the others. How can we change that? Um, yeah. <laughs> if, if there is no more questions, I'd like to, um, yeah. So. A, a, f a final thing about this book. So I knew when I wrote this book that I was um, a, a, I was targeting basically I had two audiences, two readers in mind. 
You see, going beyond this, this, this fracture, this double fracture, I wanted to get the people that are deeply involved and engaged with environmental issues to take a look at what's going on with the people that are dealing with the legacy of colonization and slavery. On the other hand, I wanted to uh, bring the people that are engaging in anti-racist movement, Afrofeminism and so on, to look at what's going on in the uh, environmental side of things. So I had two audiences in mind. And doing so, because I was doing a work on the imaginary also, I knew people from green parties and ecological movement who would read the book. And so I was trying to find ways in which I can um, enrich or create or paint a different type of imaginary. And at the start of each chapter of my book, I played a little bit with the story of the slave trade by making, uh, by giving the name or the name of a particular slave ship that historically existed with with the number of people that were on board, with the, the, the route that the slave ship took. And I try to tell the story of that particular ship at the start of each, each chapter in a manner that would uh, indicate what I was talking about in the following chapter, in the chapter that was, that was, that was to come. And the idea was to um, not just give a history, but try to have people feel um, this story, you know, so you, so you're not you're no longer in the register of demonstration. You're in the register of okay, feel what it means, what what it is, and and indeed, I met some people from the ecological movements that said, hey, Malcolm, but nobody writes actually, nobody writes about uh, this story of slavery or colonization. Like, of course, there are so many people. It's just that you, as an ecologist, have not been expose that to that to that story so i'm gonna finish with uh, just reading one of these short paragraph uh, in english and so this is at the start of the chapter 11 and the chapter is called maroon ecology fleeing the plantacinocene and the ship that i've uh, decided to talk about in that in the first in the start of this chapter is called escape um, in 1706 1707 so on September 3rd, 1706, the escape left Barbados for African coasts and their black fortunes. In a port unknown to the archives, 151 lives were chained up in a hold, destined to crawl on the colonial plantations. The weight of the chains marked the start of fierce races towards some marine elsewhere, of rebellious quests of metamorphosed bodies and of fantasized returns to remembered countries. Like other slave ships, the escape already carried in its belly the maroon's genesis of escapes in the making. Back in Barbados on May 15th, 1701, uh, 07, 121 flying desires were debarked with the powerful convictions that behind the arrogance of plantations lingered the possibility of another way, the traces of a mother earth and the horizon of the world. That's it. Thank you. I was actually going to ask you to read the one about the ship called Justice, but I, you okay. chose well. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it seemed to kind of exemplify everything. Um, we have to wrap up now, unfortunately, but um, thank you, Malcolm, thank you, Matthias, thank you to the whole institute and for all of you for coming. Yeah. And I have some copies of the book. Yes, oh yeah, books of course. If you want some. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs>